Hello, welcome back to Planescape Torment. Mink here. Sorry for the uh, abrupt end there, but interruptions. Hooray! And it was close to ending the episode anyway, so I figured let's start this one. However, I originally planned on ending the episode after talking to this guy. But, now I don't know. It might be a short episode, regardless, but we'll see. What world are you from? I come from the city of Alaburn on the River Tame. Surely you've heard of its glories and wonders. No matter, no matter. This place is benighted and ignorant when it comes to the splendors of true cities. I am told that my land is what is what is called a prime by the denizens of this city, though a prime of what, I don't know. How did you get here? I was chasing my old foe, the villainous life shade Tyr Tanoel. He pauses, waiting for acknowledgement, and then continues. He conjured his dem he conjured his demonic magic and opened himself a doorway and hur hurled himself through it. Before he could flee me entirely, I threw myself after him and found myself here. Uh, I don't think that would be wise. That sounds like quite an adventure. Have you heard of a collector named Farad? Farad? Collector? These are names and terms unfamiliar to me. But if I should hear them mentioned in any other context, I shall certainly remember your face. Indeed, I could not forget it. So, this guy is not going to know anything, so thank you, farewell, goodbye. Dakan. A party member, if I remember. The man before you is old. His dry yellow skin has the scars of one who has traveled everywhere and never rested long in any one place. His pinched face is inhumanly angular, and his ears sweep out from his skull, tapering to points. He wears a loose-fitting orange tunic, and a strange shimmering blade is strapped across his back. The blade looks to be a two-pronged glaive made of some metal whose surface swirls like a film of oil on a pond. Greetings. The man turns to you, his eyes like polished coal. He stares through you, and for a moment, you wonder if he might be blind. The weapon suddenly turns a dead, flat black, mirroring the man's eyes. Are you alright? Hail, traveler. His voice is quiet and somber, like a wind whispering through the branches of a giant tree. Hail. Your eyes are the weight of one who has traveled far to be in this place. You could say that. The man's gaze does not waver from yours. I am known as Dekan. The emphasis he places on the word known strikes you as odd, yet familiar at the same time. You are not known to me. I do not know myself. That is for the best. In knowing yourself, there would be little in the plains left worth knowing. He falls silent for a moment, still studying you with his cold black eyes. I would know why you have come to this city. I am looking for answers. I have many questions. Speak your questions. I will hear you. Uh... Your features are unfamiliar to me. What are you? A Gitzerai. A uh, Gitzerai? A Gitzerai is one of the people. One of the people? 
the Gitzerai. Yes, but what are the Gitzerai exactly? The Khan is silent for a moment, then speaks. Our history does not need to be made known to you. We would bleed to death on Time's Blade before it recited a fraction of the histories of our people. I don't need to know your histories, but I would know of your people as they are now. Dakana is silent for a moment. Know this and accept it as an answer. We are the people who make our home upon the shifting plane of limbo. With a deft motion, Dakan slips the blade from his back and holds it before him. Wait and see what happens. There we mold the matter of limbo with our minds. We forge cities with our thoughts. As you watch, a series of rippling waves of metal begin to roll forth from the center of the blade. The pitch and crest of the waves match the inflections in Takan's voice. In its chaos we dwell, with only our knowing to preserve us. We are the Gitzerai. What is that blade you have? It moved and shifted in response to your voice. It is a Karak blade. It is an object that lets others know the rank of the wielder. Karak? What does that mean? Dikon falls silent for a moment, as if searching for the correct words. In your tongue, the closest translation is chaos matter. The people may shape it with their thoughts. Shape it with their thoughts. Karak is not shaped by heat, but by knowing oneself. It is a mirror that reflects the will of the wielder on its surface and in its edge. When one knows themselves, the blade is strong, harder, and stronger than steel. When one does not know themselves, the blade is as water, formless and weak. Ooh, you'd have to argue that with Bruce. Bruce Lee, man. Be like Lata. What rank does the blade signify? The blade is a symbol carried by the Zerth. As Earth is one who knows the words of Zerthamon. In knowing the words of Zerthamon, they know themselves. Zerthamon? Zerthamon founded our race. He knew the Gitzerai before they knew themselves. He divined, defined the people. He gave them one mind. You seem to place a special emphasis on knowing. What do you mean? All things, whether structure or flesh, their existence is defined by their knowing of themselves. And if a man does not know himself? When a mind does not know itself, it is flawed. When a mind is flawed, the man is flawed. When a man is flawed, that which he touches is flawed. Dukan pauses. It is said that when a flawed man sees, his hands may make broken. Do you know yourself? Dakan falls silent. His cold black eyes take on the same distance that you noticed when you first spoke. I ask again, do you know yourself? <clears throat> when Dakan speaks again, his voice has changed, his words echo like a great stone dropped into a chasm. It looks like he is forcing the words from his chest. It is not my will that you know this. Okay, never mind. You know of a man named Farad. I'm told he knows something about me. That one is not known to me. Okay, that means you don't know a journal. Didn't think so. Can you tell me about the city? It is known by the name Sigil. Among the people, it is known as the city does th that does not know itself. It doesn't know itself? What do you mean? The city exists, but it does not know itself. In not knowing itself, its existence is flawed. It was a flawed. The city exists in opposition to itself. 
It has set itself apart from the planes, yet it seeks to be everywhere at once. Its walls are doors, yet it keeps these doors locked. Such an existence tells of a thing that does not know itself. In not knowing itself, it is flawed. <clears throat> what if the city is not flawed? A thing, a thing does not need to be ordered and have purpose to know itself. What if these contradictions are strengths that you cannot see? What if the city is not flawed and you just do not know the reasons for its contradictions? There is order in everything. Perhaps there is an underlying pattern that you cannot perceive. Sure, we'll go with that one. To your question, a question. What if the city is flawed, and you see its contradictions all around you? To your question, a question. You claim this city's existence is flawed. You have accepted this rather than explore the possibility that something greater may exist. That suggests you are flawed, and that you do not search for knowledge, but only for a convenient answer. <sighs> Sure. The Khan falls silent. There is no knowing the answer to the questions we have asked, yet the city exists. That is all. Yet I would maintain that we know ourselves by the questions we ask and the ones we do not. If we cease asking questions and accept only what we can perceive, then we will cease to know ourselves. The Khan's voice has changed slightly, become heavier. Such words have been spoken before. I have heard them and know them. <laughs> Where have you heard them? The words are mine. Once I knew them and knew their meaning. I have forgotten them until you spoke. The Khan's gaze travels through you, and his blade stops shimmering, bleeding of all color until it is translucent. There is a moment of silence that the Khan looks up at you. I would travel your path with you. You're old. Of what use could you be to me? Yeah, we'll play it like we don't know. The Khan's gaze changes. Usafi is looking past you, just as he did when you first spoke to him. I am Yul. I am old, yet I have traveled far. The arts of war are known to me. The tides of the city are known to me. Nevertheless... Where you stab in the dark, my blade strikes true. Doors locked to your hand are corridors to mine. In knowing these things through me, you will become strong. I would walk your path with you. Very well, I accept. Your path is mine. Strangely enough, his voice seems distant, and it echoes as if he was speaking from across a great distance. Very well. Let's go. Hello, Dakon. He has a whispering flask. Invokes aid and a plus two to strength, usable only by Gitzurai. This container holds a peculiar powder called Whispering Motes whose translation of the Gith expression, a form of healing powder commonly used by the Gitzerai on the plain of Limbo. When the stopper is pulled and the spice touched on the skin of a wounded person, the spice travels through the injured person's body, generating raw matter to fill up the holes in its physical form, no matter how small or large. In order for the spice to work, the user must concentrate on its healing effects. With the proper discipline, a practiced Gitzerai can even heal the greatest of wounds. In addition to its curative properties, it is also the element in several of their rites of passage. It is believed that the spice also fills, the, fills in the holes in a person's psyche, removing doubts and giving them focus and purpose. He also has an armor class of two. He's a fighter mage. Okay, Mort, you can give him the black disc, because why not? You'll be the junk carrier of the group. 
Sorry, Mort. The Unbroken Circle of Zerthamon. This small round stone is the Unbroken Circle of Zerthamon. The Unbroken Circle is a Zerth religious text containing teachings of Zerthamon, the founder of the Gitzurai people. The circle is made up of a series of interlocking circles that fold out from one another, depending on which branch the reader wishes to follow in the path of teachings. It is said that some Zerts spend years poring over the combinations of the plates, looking for new significance in, in the teachings. The Khan seems to use the text as a means of focusing his spellcasting abilities, for he pours over the tablet occasionally, memorizing the words. And he can use it. Small stone appears to be a religious text that the Khan carries. It is made up of series of blah, blah, blah. You can't figure out how to unlock the plate, so ever. Okay, leave it alone. I cannot part with that. This ceremonial armor is the symbol of a Zerth. I will not part with it. <coughs> armor class of five. The Khan ceremonial Zerth armor. It is fashioned of interlocking metal rings formed of the same substance that the Khan's blade is made of. Unlike the blade, however, it does not appear that the armor changes based on the mental state of the wielder. The armor is worn over a padded red tunic and spiked bracers and shoulder pads have been added to give greater projection to the arms and upper body. Protection. While the Khan's armor is similar to chainmail, it is lighter and more flexible, allowing him to wield his sword more effectively. Furthermore, it seems that when the sword and armor are used in tandem, the armor becomes even more fluid. Whether this is a unique property of Karak, or whether this is some magical effect of the two items, is unknown. Nikon Zerth Blade, the Chain Blade, 2 to 9 slashing, plus 1 armor class, plus 1 Thaco. In the Gitzurai home plane of Limbo, solid matter is something of a rarity. Limbo itself is a soupy mass of elements, and only through force of will can the Gitzurai shape these elements into stable matter. A substance called Karak is a material that can be shaped with the mind. Dakan's blade is composed of this substance. Through mental discipline alone, Dakan maintains the integrity of the blade. He can shape it slightly depending on his skill, adjusting its length, sharpness of the edge. Presumably, as he gains levels, he may be able to manipulate the blade in new ways. It is not known whether all Gitzurai, Zerth, carries such weapons. Certainly, a weapon that depends on the integrity of the wielder would be entrusted only to those who had learned to discipline themselves. This blade appears to have special religious significance for Dakan. Dakan has wound a series of parchments around the hilt of the blade. These appear to be mantras dedicated to Zerthamon. The blade will not exist if it is taken from me. Fine, you bum. So he only has up to level 2 spells right now. Reign of Anger he has memorized. One creature. Zertamon's teachings allow this channeling of anger unerring missile so it's magic missile one extra missile for every two levels for a total of five on its magic missile submerge the will This is a protection spell that lasts 12 seconds per level. <coughs> what else do you got? Scripture of Steel. 70 feet radius. Plus one to hit, plus one to saving throws to all creatures that are friendly. 
Yeah. It's okay. Last 30 seconds. Vilquar's eye. The target creature fails at saving throw at a negative one penalty. The creature will be struck with blindness. Nice. by race class restrictions, this spell cannot bestow a strength of 21 or greater. Well, warrior gets the biggest benefit. And then rogues and priests, lastly wizards. Still not bad. Alright, so we got a third member. Fighter 3, Mage 3, Fighter 4, Fighter 5, Ooh, not bad, War of 9, War of 4, War of 20, Edged Weapons, 2 hit plus 2, damage plus 1, Strength 17, Intelligence 13, well as a wizard, that is not good. Wisdom 13, Dex 16, Con 16. He is Lawful Neutral. He should have just stuck with Fighter, I think he would have been great. And here's his biography, for those of you who want to read it. This is a short one. Because that's it. I don't have to scroll. And there you go. You could pause the video and read that if you want to. Who is this guy? Oh. <coughs> you see a man standing stock still. He isn't moving a muscle. On closer examination, appears that it, e it appears that he isn't even breathing, just standing. His eye sockets are empty holes in his face. Contained within their bounds is a flat gray light that seems to dance with possibility. Looking into the sockets, the eerie, empty feeling of a limitless void shivers through you, as if you had gazed into a sliver of eternity. The head slowly t swivels toward you. You notice that no muscles appear to move under his skin as he turns, and he speaks in a pure bell-like tone. Well met, Wanderer. You have forgotten again, haven't you? Do you know me, stranger? Are you Farad? As he opens his mouth, you get the feeling of eternity again. Inside his mouth, you see no tongue, no teeth. It's almost as if this man were a shell surrounding an illimitable expanse. I have spoken with you before, and always you forget. Your endless quest to discover yourself ends always in your amnesia. You draw close to the truth and recoil. Let us hope that you have the strength to endure your existence. What do you know of me? How do you know this? I know that you, like a fly, rise up from the wreckage of your old shell, buzz about for a time, and curl up and die at the window of truth. You bumble about the pain, seeking the light without any plan to your actions, and fall exhausted when you fail. 
You alight on others to feed from them for a time, and move on with no regard to them. I have watched you come here and listen to your words, and watched you move away no wiser. Will you learn from your mistakes, Seeker? Attack him? I don't think that would be wise. Who are you? I am O. For some reason, when he speaks his name, it sounds like he's speaking of much more than a single letter. As if speaking of his name contained untold possibilities and nuances. No human tongue could ever create such a sound. What sort of name is that? It is my name. It is the name of a portion of eternity. I am a letter in the divine alphabet. Understanding me leads to understanding existence. I am written the true names of half of everything. My being encompasses truth. I am mathematic, organic, metaphysic. So what does that mean? The divine alphabet is written the name of everything that exists, from the seed at the hearts of the elemental planes to the core of the great beyond. My brothers and sisters, a single word translates into the two in your mind, and I reach across all that is, was, or ever shall be. We are thought and reality and concept and the unimaginable. Who are your brothers, A, E, I, and you? And sometimes why? I mean, you're not sure about why. Tell me about the great beyond. You would not understand. No mortal possibly could. It is beyond the powers of comprehension of all but the most powerful of powers. And once they understand, they move beyond the veil of mortal comprehension. I can explain it no more than that. Perhaps sometime you will understand. So what are you doing here? Why, I am watching the ebb and flow of mortality. And what do you see? You mortals are like wasps. You build your lives' nests from the slimmest of branches, and when the wind shakes your home life free, you seek to sting the wind to death. Instead of realizing your foolish mistakes, attempting to repair the damage you have caused yourselves and learning from your experience, you bring harm to any who have the misfortune to blunder near you in your time of pain and distress. My advice to you, and to all mortals, stop acting like an insect and start acting sentient. I'll think about that, in the meantime, answer some more questions. <clears throat> Have you seen or heard of Farad, the Collector? I know where he is. I can give you only one word, nearby. You will find him in the hive, under a veil of secrecy. That's what all your answers seem to be under as well. Can you give me an answer to another question? I'm looking for a journal. I know where you can find it, but it is not my place to reveal such information. Rest assured, you will find it, as well as the man you seek. What do you know of that? I know that your journey takes you far beyond your journal quest to the very edges of existence. You will struggle for your life and your very spirit, and I do not tell you any more regarding this. Tell me something else. Tell me of the patrons of this tavern. The patrons of this place are varied, yet all mortal. Like all mortals, their concerns are limited, with the potential of blossoming into actual truth. I can tell you this, though. You may find a companion dear to your heart here, at least as dear to, as your heart will allow. I think I should be insulted, but I'll let that slip. I already talked to that companion, but he's right there. So. Way to talk to him like that in front of him. Uh, tell me about yourself. I am O. Yeah, okay. What are you? Is my name. It is my name. It is the portion of extern portion of eternity. Where the divine alphabet, blah blah blah. So what does that mean? Blah, blah, blah. <coughs> the 
Then that means you know all the secrets of existence, doesn't it? I know parts of many of them. Without a connection to my brother's sisters, I am but a letter. Alone, I am a symbol. Combined, we are language and power. So you don't know the secrets of existence. I did not say that. A letter is still a powerful force, even on its own. Allow me to show you. He opens his mouth wider and wider still. The mask of his face tears around his eyes, mouth, and nose, revealing that hint, that hint of eternity you glimpsed earlier. You were lost in it, adrift in it, a part of it. You return to your mundane senses and realize that O has vanished. Yet somehow, your horizons have expanded. Enlightenment has brushed you, however briefly, across the barrel. That was indescribable. Wisdom increased permanently, plus one. Holy crap. Done. Ilkwix. Whoa, what kind of walking pattern is that? Actually, can I move? I cannot change the Nameless One's party order. Well, that sucks. So the Nameless One is always going to be in front. But since I'm weak... Let's go with this one. It's gonna be weird. <coughs> you see a short, rotund man with a perplexed expression on his face. From the lines on his loose skin, it looks like it's not too uncommon. He carries a flagon of ale that looks like it's in the process of being emptied rapidly. In between swallows, he speaks in a gentle voice, so quiet that you can barely hear his words. Hello, traveler. My name is Ilquix. Can I be of some assistance to you? Greetings. I would like to ask you some questions. What did you want to know, my friend? Who are you? I? I am but a humble man with a slight flowery poetical bent. Poetical bent. And a tendency toward the supernatural. I regret that I have none of my supplies here. Or I should be most, most eager to teach you of the ways of power. Perhaps some later time. Are there questions? Can you tell me about this place? This place? The Smoldering Corpse Tavern. A fine establishment with a fine owner. Barkus is a true gentleman and ambitious to increase his standing to boot. These, I feel, are the most useful qualities one can possess. Can you tell me about the patrons? The patrons of this tavern are many and varied. I have spoken with most and find them delightful, with the exception of those creatures of law. He gestures toward the pair of Abishai sitting in the corner. They taint the air with their presence, lending an unwholesome stench to, the, to an otherwise pleasant environment. I recommend speaking to Barkus. I understand he requires some aid with a trifling matter. Then we have that O character. I am still trying to understand him fully. It is quite an undertaking, if I say so myself. Those are the folk of interest here. The others, well, perhaps I am too discriminating. Why do you despise creatures of law? Ah, fine question, my friend. My upbringing has been on the chaotic side of the Great Ring. You may speak to Kandri and Ilborn, a misnomer if ever I heard one, of the plains. He fancies himself a great plain walker. To return from my digression, I have lived many year, my many years with chaos and find it pleasantly agreeable. To me, the taint of law, as in those creatures there, is reprehensible and tyrannical. Find it be crushed underfoot, or rather it be by an individual than a machine that knows nothing of emotion. Uh... I disagree. 
little quick smiles toothily, his fat cheeks barely moving. To each his own, I say. You have more questions. Who is the Burning Man? That? Ha. Huh. That is the last unfortunate who chose to exercise his individual will without the strength to back up his desires. His name is Ignis, and he is... was... a pyromaniac. He burned and burned and didn't burn the right people and wound up channeling more raw power than he could control. Now, well, you can see what became of him. If you wish to learn more of him, perhaps that poor creature Drusilla can help you. Farewell. Mercy killers. Grin and Tigerin. And it looks like that's it. So, let's save the game here. Talk to Ethel Grin. You see a scaled fiend who looks very, very similar to the one standing next to him. In addition to the pierced left ears, both are black-hued and reptilian, with bat wings tucked against themselves. This one is missing a tooth on its right side. Ah, take her in, it says. Our old friend has returned to pay us a visit. So he has, Ethel Green, so he has. Yet his eyes do not gleam as once they did. What do you suppose brings him back to us? What does bring you back to us, friend? Who are you? Ah, Ethel Grin. Tom is, time has robbed our companion's memory. You honestly do not recall us, do you? Truly, I am aggrieved. But... As am I, Tigerin. Truly aggrieved. Yet I rest easy. It has, after all, been many hundreds of years, and we know how the minds of mortals tend to dissipate with age. Ah, well spoken. Old friend, we are a pair of Abishai on leave from our current assignment in Bator. I am Tigerin in the th the th <coughs> Oh, excuse me, excuse me. Ugh. Talking in this this plane is a bit hard on the throat, you understand. <coughs> I am Tigerin, the thrice damned, so named for my ability to find the best in every situation. This is Aethelgrin, who has earned himself no special name, though not for lack of trying. Lack of trying? What do you mean? Aethelgrin ignores you as it responds to his companion. And once again, Tegarin, you have cut straight to the truth of the matter. Though perhaps it is best not to have earned the sort of notice one bearing the name Thrice Damned must surely have incurred. Incurred. Ah, uh, I had some other questions. Mort whispers to you. Boss, I don't like this. They're not supposed to be in here. The Blood War hasn't kicked the Celestial's asses bad enough that any fiend can go on furlough. They want something. Tread carefully. In the meantime, Tigerin continues to respond to its companion. In its turn, Tigerin ignores you as it replies to its comrade. Once again, I maintain that any notice is better than no notice at all. Yabashite turns back to you. Old friend, does this answer your question as to our identities? No, I had some other questions. What are you doing? What are we doing? Why is it not perfectly clear, old friend? We are on leave from our beloved assignment, taking for ourselves some much needed rest and perhaps inducing some additional recruitment for our glorious cause. Our superiors fully support our presidents, to be sure. In a more immediate sense, we are taking our entertainment in this delightful establishment, and of course we are celebrating the return of our friend, old friend. However, the stench of the breezes, which occasionally waft the scent of goodness in the door, debases us somewhat, leaving us physically, mentally, and spiritually weaker. Fortunately, the air in this ward of the city carries a delicious tang of pain and supplication. Wouldn't you agree? A grin, the fiend smiles broadly at you. Some other questions. You know a collector named Farad. Farad, I have heard the name. 
Is he not a sage of some sort, a necromancer, or is he a diviner of rubbish? I have heard of him, friend, but do not have the pleasure of his company. Perhaps one of the other patrons here can help you. You know, one of the lesser beings. I'm looking for a journal. I keep no journals, friend, and I counsel that you should not either. Ask my dear comrade Tegrin why, and you shall receive enlightenment. Very well. Why should I not receive it? Keep a journal. Because, friend, it is easy to make the mistake of committing a true ward to posterity, and easier still for someone you once trusted. And here he shoots a glance full of venom at Aethelgrin to find that word and use it against you. Indeed, it can even lead to actions tantamount to desertion. Leaving or losing a journal can cost you your very existence. Boss, I'm more than ever that these Burks ain't on the up and up. Sounds to me like they've deserted, like they're looking for some angle that'll elevate their status in Baytor. You don't want to be talking to them, boss. You don't know what game they're playing and you could get burned, literally. Alright, Mark, just a few questions. Why, is that a little floating skull I see? There's a lovely sweet scent of Baytorian decay about you, my pretty. Perhaps we should discuss this later. Yepishai returns his attentions to you. Now then, you said you had some questions. Tell me about fiends. As we see it, there are two kinds of fiends. Those who are, those who are correct and those who are not. Our side, that of the Beta Zoo, is correct. The other side, that of the cursed, hated, chaotic Tanari, is incorrect and must be exterminated. We hold the Tanari directly responsible for the blood war. Were it not for them, we could have settled the lower plains in peace and wouldn't have all the bother of fighting this wretched war, nor would the unfortunate spillovers into other plains be such a cause for concern among the namby pambying do-gooders. The Tanari are directly to blame for the multiverse's sad state of affairs. That's not really what I was asking. I wanted to know what differentiates you from them. Nefine pauses a moment and then brightens. Ah, yes. You see, we represent law and order. Those who break the law must be punished. If we have no law, we have only anarchy. Surely you can see what anarchy has done for the Abyss. It has spawned horrors beyond imagining. Any excesses the Beta Zoo state may have indulged in are simply to counter the rising tide of chaos represented by the Tanari. We mean no harm to anyone, we just prefer to understand where the boundaries are. You mean no harm to anyone. Right. Uh, is it? Farewell. He has a faint scent of Baytorian decay, huh? Hey, what's eating you, Chief? <clears throat> you said you're a Mimir, right, Mort? Yeah, Mimir's a floating encyclopedia. You put information in, you get information out. How did you die, Morton? No idea, Chief. I kind of forgot when I died. Can't say I blame myself much. At least there was something waiting for me after I died, even if it is a life as a floating skull. I mean, it could have been worse. What happened to your body? Eh, I don't know, alright. It's just gone. Morton glares at you. I don't think I miss it because I'm happy just the way I am, and I don't need your half-wit judgments or snide remarks, alright? Whatever, let's go. Come on, shake a leg. <laughs> oh, man. Nothing more, just like, checking to see if you're still with me. Mercy Killer Patron. <coughs> <coughs> An armored behemoth, this man is huge. He also seems to have a very keen eye. It misses nothing and transpire that transpires around him. It also seems that he has no interest in speaking to you. 
Hello. The man stares at you as if you were some form of bug. He stares at you, blinking slowly. He turns his head, then dismissing you without speaking a word. Hello. You hear a subterranean rumble beginning deep in the man's chest. He lightly strokes his weapon and stares at you with renewed interest. Okay, goodbye. With this guy walking around. Hold still, bud. You see a lad who barely looks a day over 18. His face seems to betray some tension. Help you, Cutter. Should give him a deeper voice than that, but whatever. Who are you? I am Caleb. I am a mercy killer. I'm here with Tarner and Ilsadon to catch my first criminal. What can you tell me about the mercy killers? Well, they... Sorry, I... I have to get used to saying that now. I believe that justice is the most important thing in existence. I believe that without justice there is no meaning, and without meaning we might as well just go off and kill ourselves. I don't want to kill myself, so I decided justice is the meaning. If you want to know more, you ought to ask one of these other two, or find one of our recruiters. They'll talk your ear off. I might do that, answer some questions. I'm looking for a journal, if you haven't seen one. A journal? No, sorry. I'm still new here, so I'm not all that connected yet. If I see one, I'll let one know. Or, I'll let you know. What are you doing? Well, seeing as I'm a new mercy killer, I'm supposed to bring a criminal to justice to show I can handle the field work. I decided I wanted to catch a killer, so we asked around and got told he was going to be here. Still haven't seen him, though. I'm a little nervous, to tell the truth. If you'll excuse me, I really ought to get looking at the faces here again. He cranes his neck and looks around the bar. Just a few more and I'll leave you go. Hold on. I'm looking for, I'm looking for a collector who goes by the name of Farad. Can't say I've heard of him. Is he a criminal? Maybe we'll pick him up later. My thanks for tip-off, citizen. Who are your friends here? They're the people who are here to make sure I don't foul up this assignment. Tarner's the older one. Ilsadon's the one who's here to make sure I do the job right and to give me support if I need it. He swallows noisily. I hope I won't. Has your killer shown up yet? No, not yet. But Tarner says that this is where the criminal's supposed to come, eventually. So now we play the waiting game. Good luck. this other dude. You see a grizzled, burly man in spiked armor. He eyes you coolly and slowly up and down, evaluating you. He pauses for a time. He pauses for a time on your face, almost as if it jogs his memory somehow. He sighs then and says, can I help you with something, friend? Who are you? Me? I'm Tarner. What's with the outfit? It's a uniform of a kind. We're the Red Death, mercy killers. We're the justice folks. If someone commits a crime, we bring, we bring them to justice. We right wrongs, too. You want to know more? Go talk to one of the recruiters. Did you recognize me? I thought I did, but those pictures are centuries out of date and the suspect would be dead by now. Of course, these are the planes and stranger things have happened. Still, if you're the feller I'm thinking of, it looks like you've served your sentence by means of pain. What can you tell me about this person you're talking about? It was a particularly brutal criminal, from what I understand. This was, of course, centuries ago. Immense strength, they said, and enough anger to tear the head from a barrier. Not a sod to be messing with. Word is, he got himself surrounded by a red death patrol, escaped through a portal, and hasn't been seen since. He frowns, studying you. 
They have pictures of him. Take away some of the scars and you might be related to him. Probably not him, though. Who are your friends here? They're Caleb and Ilsadon. Caleb's the new mate, the new recruit. Ilsadon's the muscle. I'm the brains. Recruit? Is that why you're all dressed the same? Is a uniform. Have you ever heard of a collector by the name of Farad? I'm looking for him. You're looking for him, eh? From the tone of your voice, I'm betting it won't be for a quick drink down at the local tavern either. Oh, excuse me. See, I know Farad of old. He's a slippery one, he is, and it'll be a time before we can pin something on him. Problem is, only fanatic like Ve... Ve Lord scragged the guy without even a shred of proof. That's all a long way of saying I don't know where the sod is, but you ought to know he's a suspect and it won't do you any good to be seen with him. I'm looking for a journal, have you seen one? I see far too much on the mean streets of Sigil, friend. Unless this journal was something spectacular, chances are good I ain't seen it. Tell me about this place. This? It's the smoldering corpse. Chan is, this place is full of portals and such, but then that's true of most anywhere in Sigil. Good cheap drinks, and if you don't mind the company of bubbers and fiends, it ain't a bad place to be. You want to know more about the place, talk to the bartender or something. Very well. Goodbye. Okay, Barkus, it's your turn. <coughs> you see a leather-skinned man with just a hint of ashen color to his face. His teeth seem sharper than normal, and his eyes are filled with the boredom that comes with having seen too much. His voice is nasal and clipped. You again, eh? What do you want this time? You again? What do you mean? Yeah, you again. You got a hearing problem or something now? He was in here about 15 years ago, got all bubbed up, smashed up the place, and left a pile of coin that wasn't enough to pay for the damages. So you plucked out your own bleeding eyeball and tells me you'll be back to reclaim it when you got 200 coins together. With 15 years of interest, you got about 500 coins. You got the jink pal, I got your eye. 500? That's ridiculous. He pauses for a moment, considering. That it is. Tell you what, give me 300 and the eye's yours. Uh Forget it, I'll be back later. Save the game. Do we even have 300? Yeah, okay. We got it. Back again, what now? You said you had my eye. I'd like it back now. 500, that's ridiculous. Give me 300. It's, your, it's a deal, here's your money. It's a deal. He produces a darkened, wax-stoppered, wide-mouth bottle from his pocket. You hear the sound of liquid sloshing around inside it, along with a heavier, squishier noise. Opening it, the stench of some sort of preservative agent nearly makes you gag. Floating in the viscid muck is an eyeball. You'd better figure out what you want to do with that. Now you've exposed it to the air, you might as well put a pickled egg in the jar for all the good it'll do you. Make up your mind, Cutter. Pickled egg or not. Tear out your eyeball and place this one in the socket. Okay. 300 copper for a thousand experience. With a moment's hesitation, you reach into your socket and pop your eye into the palm of your hand. The bartender helpfully severs the optic nerve and directs your hand to the jar of goo that sits on the bar. You deposit your eye in the preservative, wrap your fingers around the old one, and slide it into your empty socket. The pain of this entire operation is incredible. After a moment, though, you can feel the optic nerve reattaching itself to this new eye, and suddenly you're hit by the flash of a memory. A vast expanse of chaotic, ever-changing wasteland stretching before you. 
group of humanoid vultures plummeting toward you, cruel weapons ready to strike, your own shining blade clutched tight in your fist. Three tufts surround you, in the colors of an enemy you can't quite place. Long daggers glisten in their hands, and the light glints cruelly from their exposed teeth. You glance at your scarred hands and know that soon they'll be covered in blood. An enormous frog-like creature comes bounding over through under chaos stuff, headed for you with a mouthful of teeth. You hurl your javelin through the shifting matter and pin the creature to a sudden stone plinth. You have recalled some of your lost fighting skills. Proficiency points increased permanently. Okay. Who are you? Me? I'm Barkas, owner and keeper of this place. What is this place? Can't you see the sign out front? Can't you see the burk burning over the phonus when you came in? It's the smoldering corpse cutter. Best damn bub house and sigil. At least it's the best damn bub house in this part of the hive. Which makes it one of the best in sigil. Hell, they got fancy places with plants and such in the ladies' ward, and they got fiendish taverns salted around the rest of the hive, but none of them got the character of the smoldering corpse. Who is the corpse, anyway? Him? Ignis. He used to be a flame wizard. Burned down pieces of the hive and got himself scragged by a bunch of other mages. When you know more about him, go talk to Drusilla down there by the door. you tell me about the patrons? I don't make it a point to interfere with the lives of the people who give me their hard-earned jink unless they ask me to. So, over there is Candrian, Plane Walker. He's a good one to talk to about any plane walking questions you might have. He's been pretty much everywhere. Down there is Ed Cre Eb Creekneys, an old Harmonium basher. Don't hold that against him. And a tout. He's got a good heart in him and he knows Sigil up and down. Them fiends over there are Aethelgrin and Tickerin. Word of advice, don't deal with them. They might be low rankers in the fiend hierarchy, but they're still fiends. And you got Ilquicks over there, not trustworthy, and some mercy killers looking for some poor sod. The con that gets awry is a mystery to me. Don't know much about him. You don't talk much. Finally, you interested in earning some free bub? Sure. There's a bubber over against the far wall hanging about in the shadows who's been trying to work up her courage to slip out without covering her tab. I want you to make sure she don't do that. You do it, you got free bub here for life. I'll do it, answer me some questions first. I'm looking for Farad. He turns and spits on the floor. Farad, pa! You may as well just turn your back and let him sink a dagger in it. But from the looks of you, you already have. If you're dead set on finding Farad, pardon the pun. Talk to Ebb Creek Knees over there. You should know something of value. Looking for a journal. A journal? Paper and words? Friend, that sort of thing don't get much stock down here in the hive. Folks here can barely read the sign above the door, much less an entire journal. If you're looking for a journal, you'd better have... You'd do better to have a system instead of asking folks willy-nilly. Actually, a good point. But... All right, farewell. So over here in the darkness, huh? Yeah, there is somebody over there. Uh, you see someone dressed as a female dustman with a half-empty glass in her right hand. As you near her, she calls out to you. Um, you over here. You notice that there's something wrong about her, and your exposure to the Dustman leads you to believe that she's just too lively to be a real member of the faction. Hey Cutter, buy a lady a drink? You're not really a Dustman, are you? She looks around nervously and seems to sober right up. Why, um, why do you say that? Because you don't act like a Dusty, and you're not offering contracts. In fact, you're taking money in instead of giving it out for that corpse labor they do at the mortuary. She stifles a squeak of terror and hastens to explain. 
No, 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 no. I'm not a dustman. I just found these robes in the street, and I didn't have enough money to get good clothes, and I uh, heard there was a dustman thief around. But you could probably find him somewhere else in the southwest part of the hive. I saw him, but I hid from him. Please don't hurt me. I'm not planning on it, but you ought to know you're not pulling it off too well. What, um, what do you want to know? Who are you? Me? I'm Mokai. I just like to, uh, drink here and, uh, she loses her train of thought momentarily. I'm just a person, you know. Oh, are you? What is this place? Smoldering Corpse Tavern. Can't you read? You are more bub than I am? Probably. Should be. Poison her drink with embalming fluid. <sighs> yeah. Orca says it's time for you to settle your tab. Pay up. She jumps a little, and her nervous tension becomes full-fledged anxiety. What are you going to do? Ask you to pay up. Now. Uh, I can't afford it. Can you spot me just 10%? I'll, um, give it to him, and he knows I'll pay the rest. How much do you need? Um, I think I need about a hundred coins to get started on the debt. What? A hundred? How big is your tab, lady? Good God. Can you think of another solution? Another way to pay? Huh. She smiles sadly. You could always, um, kill me. I could, but I'd rather find another solution. I could, but... What's that over there? <laughs> Look, a three-headed monkey. Stand all right. Do you want something else? Sure. Pay up. Let's get pay up now. What do you need? I lend you the money. Here, take it and pay up now. She pockets your jink, glances briefly toward the door, almost as if she's weighing her chances of dashing out. Sighs heavily as she realizes there's no chance and begins to walk glumly toward the bar. Um, my thanks, I suppose. Don't mention it. Don't even think about heading for the door until you've paid up. Oh my god. Anyway, that formation... Dude, oh, that's really bugging me. How about this one, since it's the default... You know, like... Baldur's Gate formation. Won't be having trouble with Mokai again. Then, friend, you have full bar priv privileges for free. Anything you want, anytime. That must have been a pretty big tab she ran up. You don't know the half of it. You want to drink now? Sure. You want to drink? You got to drink. This is what we got for you. Beer, bitters, mead, elemental water, Eberian fire wine, and fire seeds. Cursed heart wine and Praetorian whiskey. What'll it will be?
beer. You quaff the wheat drink. Flavor isn't exactly bold, but it's filling and it's alcoholic. It doesn't seem to do anything else for you. What will it be, Cutter? Another... Bitters. You quaff the weak drink. The flavor isn't exactly bold, but... Okay, give me another. Mead. Quaff the wheat. Okay. Give me another. Water. He moves back to a keg on the wall and turns to spigot. The clearest water you have ever seen pours from the nozzle into the glass he holds underneath it. He sets it down in front of you, and you take a deep drop. It is the purest thing you have ever tasted, a coldness inherent to the water itself, a feeling of air that passes over your tongue and into your stomach, where its coolness calms even the raging of your passions for a moment. From the heart of the elemental plane of water, Marcus snorts, any other water you ever drink is going to taste dirty by comparison. Huh. Fire wine and fire seeds. He passes you a glass of deepest of deepest red wine and a handful of brightly colored seeds. Stick the seeds in your mouth, he advises, and take a swig of the wine. Don't be surprised when the seeds catch fire. They won't do you any harm. It's a taste like no other. He's right. When you pop a seed into your mouth, it mingles with your saliva and bursts into a tiny flame. You quench it with a swallow of fire wine, and the taste is indescribable. Marcus smiles. You want another? Keep them coming, keep them coming. Heart wine. He passes you a glass of cursed, famous heart wine. The bouquet is breathtaking, and the wine itself is full-bodied and fruity. The aftertaste leaves nothing to be desired. Made from real razor vine, that is. Wish I knew the secret. The barkeeper nods at the empty glass. You want another? Certainly do. Whiskey. He places a shot of some steaming substance that looks like boiling urine in front of you. The fumes that waft your way, however, are exquisitely tempting. The taste, though nearly unbearably hot, is as smoky as the scent. The feel of the liquor burning its way to your gut is nearly painful, yet even this pain is sweet. The barkeep's eyes widen. Still standing. Most folks can't even make it halfway through the first shot. I feel fine. I don't even feel anything. The barkeep considers you carefully, resting his chin on his hand. You know, Cutter, there's some... There's some as have a natural immunity to poisons and such. Some folks call Bubba poison. If that's the case, chances are good you got yourself a handy little defense going against poisons. Poisoners. How about that? Give me another drink anyway. How about some more uh, whiskey? Well, that's the exact same. Okay. Information. Yeah, we've been through this. Forget it. Farewell. All right. Back here. Yes. This once functional door is now nailed shut and barred on the inside to protect, protect against thieves. Okay. Well, we are now done with the smoldering corpse. Mokai has still not made it out of the building. Although, why is she leaving? Okay, you can be on your way. Because she still owes him money. But, she's leaving. Whatever, I guess, but... You would think he would uh, not allow that. Oh well. But anyway, I guess we're killing this guy. Die. I'm gone. Rusty 
dagger, that's worth it. Let's go talk to Craddock since I forgot to talk to Craddock. I'm gone. And then we'll go to the, uh, the, uh, uh, crypt or whatever. You see Craddock. His scowl has deepened since when you first saw him. Looks like it's about to crack his face in two. I found Jaylai. Is that right? Craddock glances around. Where is he then? Uh, truth. He said to pike off that you were a cur of the lowest sort and that he wasn't going to work for you any longer. Updated my journal. Product's face turns bright red and his face cracks into a snarl. Damn be his name. May, may all the evils of the plain sound his footsteps. A blistering stream of insults, threats, and speculation about highlight J.L.I.'s family roots issue. Family roots issues from Craddock's mouth. New taunts, all right. Ooh, Mort clicks his teeth together as Craddock builds up steam. You can almost hear him taking notes inside his skull. <laughs> Craddock finishes tirade with a grunt. Damn that J.L.I. You know, I could fill in for him if you need help. Craddock studies you for a moment. Ye ha, ye couldn't. He suddenly falls silent. Well, mayhap you can. It's hard work and there's no drinking on my watch. Understood, let's get started. The work is long, but the end, at the end of the shift you are not the least bit tired. Craddock grunts as you return. You did well enough, here's your pay. He tosses you a handful of coins. No get, we've no more use for you. Farewell. Actually, I got a specialization point, didn't I? Yes. And he can only teach me up to two pluses. or the dagger, but its damage is greater. It crushes the body of an opponent like a falling rock. Do you wish to use a portion of your talent to attain the level of proficient in this weapon? What would you have to say about hammers? One who would use the hammer. Its speed is not that of the club, but its damage is greater. The damage is like the falling of a great rock, crushing the body of an opponent. Do you wish to use a portion of your talent to attain the level proficient with this weapon? You know, sure, I've always had a soft spot for hammers and mauls and maces and, you know, things that crush 
for some reason, they kind of take a back seat to axes and swords. But I think maiming some somebody without lopping off a limb is equally and perhaps even more disturbing. You know, just having like this leg that's crushed and hanging loose and kind of useless instead of just hacking it off. I don't know. Maybe that's just me and my twisted mind, but that's how I feel. Updated so my sure journal. I'll learn hammers. And Done. now we go up here. Hey, some thugs. You know what? Endure. We should get some female zombies and join the draw. Right, Chief? Okay. I'm gone. What's up? Sure, why not? Come on. Actually, did Mort get a... Yeah. Hey, we're being watched, Chief. Just look natural. Nope, you can still uh, use that once. Casual. There you go. That's what we were looking for. Do you see that? Nice. Do you see that? Nice. So, all right. Done. <laughs> the spectral figure materializes from the gloom of the passageway ahead and quickly moves to block your path. It floats before you, its once human features twisted in a mask of rage. Defilers! Leave this place at once. Greetings. Leave now, its booming voice echoes down the halls. This place is forbidden to the living. Leave while you still can. I had some questions. Seek your answers elsewhere. This place is a sanctuary for the dead. I shall not permit their slumber to be disturbed by the intrusion of yet another insolent mortal. Another? Has someone else been here? If you must know, yes, there is another intruder who, even now, continues to violate the sanctity of these hallowed halls. The angered in the spirit's voice fades. He seems somewhat saddened by the admission. The souls of my brothers and sisters cry out for peace. Why didn't you drive this intruder away? I cannot. The coward has sealed himself within the inner chamber of the mausoleum. He has erected powerful wards that bar my entrance into the chamber. It is from there that he calls upon his dark arts to awaken my brethren and bends them to his evil will. Perhaps I may be of assistance to you. The spirit remains silent for several long moments. You can almost feel the weight of his lifeless gaze upon you. Yes, you might you might prevail where I have failed. If you will pledge to me to get, to rid me of this black guard, blackguard, I shall grant you passage. What say you? I'll do Updated it. Updated my journal. So be it. The spirit slowly begins to fade until only the echoing of its disembodied voice remains. But take heed, tread lightly in these halls, lest you join the others in eternal rest. I'm gone. And with that, we are going to call this an episode. So, we will explore this mausoleum next time. I'm hope you are, I hope you're enjoying the run so far. I, I apologize for the interruptions that, came, that have come up in the past. And will probably again come up in the future. But those are out of my control. But regardless, 
Until next time, folks. Farewell. <laughs>